Hi there and welcome back to the Daily Upari. I am Upari. I'm the painter that's going to be presenting you with painting footage in real time every single day of the week. And the way that we are going to proceed with this is that I'm going to film pretty much every single brushstroke involved in creating all of these paintings. The way that you're going to receive the video is, is I'm going to split it up into segments so each day of the week you'll receive roughly, I don't know, 30, 45, maybe up to an hour long uh, painting footage of me guiding you through the uh, process. You know, it's not always about just trying to say um, first step, block in your shape, second step, do this, third step, do that. No, it's much more of an interactive process and it is my pleasure to bring you into that experience. That being said, on our palette today, we have added quite a few colors. So we actually have ex an extended color palette now and a different palette. Remember that large palette that I had before? Well, the thing about this palette, it's not, the, uh, it's not the, as large of a palette, but it fits in my freezer, believe it or not. So each day, um, I finish up with the painting session. I'm going to just stick this thing in the freezer. Obviously, I'll clean up the uh, mixing space, but you know, I'll leave these be, and uh, we'll see that you know having more colors on the palette is actually going to help us have a little bit more freedom with our color and even our value range. So that being said, we have titanium white, flake white, burnt umber, alizarin crimson permanent, perylene red, cadmium red medium. Cadmium orange, cadmium yellow deep, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow medium. It looks like yellow light, but it's cadmium yellow medium. This color in particular, this is a gambling color. So we have cadmium green, sap green, cobalt teal, ultramarine blue, dioxazine purple, ivory black, and our painting medium of choice is Neo McGilp. And tell you what, what I'm going to do from now on, I'm going to keep this as the um, the permanent color palette, you know, minus underpaintings, but the permanent color palette. So I think with each segment or each video, I'm going to just say that I'm going to leave the, the colors. Sorry, I can't speak today. I'm going to leave the colors in the uh, description box down below because that did take a long time to read off all of those colors. So how about what we just jump right into the painting now? So. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a little bit of our medium, the Neo McGilp, and we're going to oil out the segments that we're going to work on in the painting. And I think that we're going to work on the face and the background colors for the majority of the painting. So uh, let's just go ahead and start to apply the Neo McGilp medium. And you can see there how um, it's starting to bring back the original values that we had before. So I think I'm gonna just apply it uh, actually to uh, the face for now and the hair and then the background. I don't think we're gonna need to apply that much medium. So what this does, uh, for those of you that may be new to this channel, so what this is, is oiling out. So basically what we're doing is we're adding another layer of oil to the painting um, and what that does is it's going to allow the paint to uh, be a little bit more uh, forgiving when we apply and it'll be easier even to subtract paint off of this if we make any mistakes, which I'm sure I'm going to make some mistakes. So, um, and another thing it does is it adds another layer of medium. And when you're layering with oil paint, you actually want to increase the amount of medium that you add. That's the fat over lean principle. So uh, that only applies to when that you're working on top of dry successive layers. So uh, classically, you want to increase the amount of oil you use with the, um, you know, the addition of more layers. So to put it more simply, add more layers, increase more oil, that's it. And this kind of automatically uh, allows us to do that. And it also creates a little bit of a nicer surface to work onto. So, um, here is an image of our model, Madeline, and I'm gonna keep a picture of her to the top left corner of your screen so you can follow along with me as I develop this painting. So let's go ahead and mix up some color now. And we're gonna to wanna to start off actually with our darks. Um, so I'm gonna start off with the ivory black, the alizarin permanent, ivory black, alizarin permanent, 
And you know what, now that we have it, let's throw it in there. A little bit of dioxazine purple. A little more neo, maybe medium. I don't need that much more medium. So that's gonna be our dark. Maybe it's gonna be too dark, so I'll tell you what. Uh, so to bring the value up a little bit, I'm not gonna use one of these guys. I'm gonna use a little bit of burnt umber. See that? And a, the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest bit of the yellow ochre. Just a little bit though. And we're gonna start off with the uh, the hairline. So starting right up here. And we want to establish our darker darks right away. Not always the case, but just because this is such a light underpainting, uh, I think it's important to just kind of jump in with the darks. And you know, just further increase the contrast. Contrast is actually a very good thing um, in painting, just like it is in uh, photography. So. You're going to notice that with these angles, these uh, camera angles, I'm going to be uh, putting the photo reference in and out of certain shots. So once that shot is like this one, where you can clearly see, uh, you know, space within, you know, a rectangle here and then a little bit of a rectangle there, then I will use the photo reference when I'm further back and talking to you. As you noticed before, uh, I probably won't have the photo reference there as I'm talking to you, or even uh, when I was applying the paint to the hair, you didn't need the photo reference for that. So again, I'm trying to make a painting show, a daily show, and you're gonna be an important part of that show. So let me know in the comments down below if it's okay for me to format it in this kind of way. I certainly do enjoy uh, you know, the production aspect of all of these videos. And maybe, just maybe, I want to not make this area so dark. So what I'm gonna do is add a little more of something in here. This is why I said that these colors are going to help, not only with you know putting in more color, but also with value. So originally I was gonna jump right into the yellow ochre automatically, but then I realized, you know, we have some more options now. So let's use the, um, how about the cadmium orange, a color that we haven't used in quite a long time. See how it raises the value quite quite a bit. So we want maybe a little bit more, and a little more Neo McGill medium. And let's see how this does. See that, it raises the value quite nicely. And I don't need that much of it, so just kind of etching the paint onto it, just like if this was a, a thing of charcoal, just kind of sketching it onto the surface. And that's just going to help uh, make these darks look even darker. You may not notice it now, but in, in later uh, layers or later on in the painting, you'll see how this will affect the overall value scheme. Maybe we'll throw in a little more over here. Just a little bit. And what we're gonna want now, we're gonna want a designated um, background brush. So let's see here. I think we're gonna take, um, hmm. yeah, how about th this one? Let's, let's take this one. So use it or lose it, right? So we're going to go ahead and use some of our new additions here. So the perylene red is um, it's a nice kind of mix between alizarin, uh, the alizarin and the cat red. But you would say, well, why don't you just mix the two together and then you get this? Well, I found that you know you can get a similar color uh, mixing just the alizarin and the cadmium red, but you lose a little bit of the intensity of the pigment uh, when you do that. And I only kind of just discover that through experience, really. Uh, one of these days I was like, I have perylene red, I'll just try it out. Maybe you remember which video that is, actually. One of these, uh, I don't know, however many videos ago I decided to throw in perylene red. And that's also how we came upon the, um, the cadmium green as well. So let's go ahead and um, now with a little bit of alizarin crimson permanent, a little bit more medium. I have to really uh, be careful with this color. I don't want to make it too dark, and I don't want to make it too too uh, plain. I don't want to make a plain color, so we're going to use a little bit of the cadmium orange. 
And now we have a very, very bright color, as you can tell. So what we want to do is um, we don't want it to be too bright. So I'm going to add a little bit of, I, I have several choices now. I could jump right into the uh, burnt umber or I could go in with the dioxazine purple. And, uh, you know, since the dioxazine kind of will complement and uh, probably kill the color a little bit too much, I'm going to go with the burnt umber. Let's play it kind of safe. And then the cadmium red. Then back to the perylene. And I'm not trying to color match by any means. I'm just trying to see um, these large shapes of colors in relations. All right, so let's let's see how let's see how this one will do. So let's just put that color on here. And I have you way back there at a distance, just so you can see. Um, the intensity of the color. So that on its own is too bright. Yes, I know that the photo reference isn't there, uh, but I tell you what, we don't really need it that much. The photo reference is a reference. It's not really there for us to copy it. So I'm gonna add a little bit more of the burnt umber into that mixture. And uh, I think we're kind of where we wanna be in terms of the color. So I'll tell you what, this is about interpreting visual information. It is not at all about trying to copy the image that we're looking at. And that's actually a very, very, um, how, how to put it, it's a, it's a very delicate balance. When you're a realist painter or you, uh, you know, you paint realistic portraits, you paint uh, portraits or figures or landscapes or whatever. When you're painting a thing to make it look like a thing, you're walking a very, very um, tight, should I, not a tight rope, but it's a very, very delicate balance because if you go too close, if I make this too close to the photo reference, then I may ask myself, why? Uh, why then am I even painting if I'm just recreating the work of a camera? So really it's, it's about involving a little bit of interpretation into it. You don't necessarily have to paint every aspect of what you're looking at exactly the way you're looking at it. Instead, I think it's important to uh, keep a little bit of a dialogue between, you know, the nature versus what you're actually painting. And by dialogue, I mean interpretive aspect of it. And yes, I know I'm using probably, uh, I don't know, too small of a brush uh, to uh, cover certain areas. And I'm still struggling with this autofocus. I don't know if it's the camera or what, but I do have it on manual. I've had it on manual the whole time, but anyway. Anyway, no one wants to hear of my camera struggles. Um, I'm just covering a little window because I think I'm just gonna work in this little window for now. And the background is included in the darks. So I, like I said, I wanted to state the darks first. Now that we have the background all covered, we have several options now. So we can go into the darks for the shadows. We can go into the darks for the side planes of the face. We could go into the darks for the clothing that the model is wearing. So I'll tell you what, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go in for the darks uh, for the mandible here. So well, I think I'm gonna need a different brush for that. So I don't know, maybe, uh, let's look at these bristles here. Yeah, because I don't want I don't want it to be too large of a brush, but I do want it to be. Mm, let's see, not in the best shape, I know, but I think that this guy will will do the trick. So now that we have this brush, uh, the mandible, the color for the mandible is pretty green. It looks like a very neutral greenish color. So I'm going to just go with my instinct. So we're going to use the sap green over here, a little bit of the sap green, yellow ochre, perylene red, just to, you know, contrast the red and the green, burnt umber, cobalt teal to raise the value and to, um, to raise the value and to cool down the color a little bit, burnt umber, yellow ochre, Back to the burnt umber.
All right, so this is pretty good. It might be too green. So just to be safe, a little bit more perylene red and just a little bit of perylene red. I really love saying perylene. So perylene red is just it's a lot of fun. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. Am I saying it wrong? Is it perylene red, perylene red? I don't know. Tomato, tomato, right? Okay, so let's fill in, let's fill in a little bit of a value here. And I'm pretty darn sure that Manual focus better not be picking up my hand. Okay, it's not picking up my hand. Anyway, um, let's go ahead and just put in this shape. Now, we want to think about the structure of the mandible. So I'm thinking of uh, these areas now in terms of plane. So this is one plane here for the jawbone. And then it starts to actually taper upwards in this direction. And the planes are actually going to start to merge into that kind of direction. So now what we're gonna do is, um, you know, after we cover this with the green, I am gonna let some of the transparency do some of the work for me, might as well, since I am layering. So here you can actually see I'm letting the transparency show through. So I'm just going to cover all the way up over here. And now I'm actually, you know, usually I work from the forehead down, but I, I like to change things up a little bit. So. I think what I'm gonna do is uh, actually start to introduce the flesh tones uh, via the uh, mandible and work those planes upwards and then try to uh, you know create the volume around here because this is one of the most subtle areas and then the features you know we'll just throw the features in there uh, at some point in this um, you know in this painting so let's return to the palette here and um, I could use this green, but this has now become my shadow brush. Notice how I'm starting to collect quite a lot of brushes here. I don't need to hold all of them at once, so I think I'm gonna put the, uh, the background brush off to the side. Yep, you'll go right there. Oh, and by the way, we have some more post-it notes. If you uh, remember the post-it notes from the videos a few days ago. So you don't need to do anything special to get a post-it note. Just go ahead and leave a comment down below. You have a question, I'll read it, I'll study it, and I'll paraphrase it into just a few sentences, sentences, into a few words. So let's start off with this one. All right, so this is our first post-it note. All right, so the person that left the comment uh, the YouTube name Chin and uh, Two. I paraphrased everything, sorry. So you were talking about Chiroscuro and uh, you know how to get better at Chiroscuro and uh, what books to look at. So what books to look at for Chiroscuro. So I'm going to be reading out these post-it notes as they pertain to the process of the painting. So um, Chiroscuro is basically the study of light and dark. That's what it means, light and dark. So if you look over here, the chin is actually going to be a uh, pretty good, uh, so the chin, the, uh, the jawline and the chin here is actually going to be a really good structural point to start to uh, develop the value changes. But it's also going to introduce uh, what I like to call the, uh, the dark light. And you see here this point, so this is going to be the division between light and shadow. So that's why I chose that post-it note because, again, I really wanted to uh, bring you into this process. This is a very much... As, this is as much about you as it is about me. This is a very interactive process and I really want my daily show to be uh, an interactive process. So right there, okay? There. That is your chiroscuro right there in, in a nutshell. Basically the transition from light. All of this, even though there's no specificity there, we still get a sensation of light to dark. And again, what I'm trying to get at is the dark light and it's going to be a very descriptive value. So for chiroscuro, do the best that you can with just light. So right here, we're looking at right here, just light and shadow and the dark light. And if you can make that dark light as specific as possible, you will get the gradations of form. You can look at old masters such as Caravaggio where that transition is so well understood. But let's go ahead and mix up some paint for that. And what we want is, um, again, a gradation of tone uh, so that what's going on on the palette is um, you know reminiscent of what's going on here or what's going on here is reminiscent of what's going on on palette. So we have the shadow brush and now we're going to use this brush here. 
And we're going to start to utilize all of our colors to create our flesh tone variation. So we're going to create our little color value web from here all the way across here. So let's go ahead and start with the uh, half tones, and this is going to give rise to the uh, the dark light. So very much just red and green, uh, contrary to what you would expect a flesh tone would be. Uh, it's actually really really nice to go between the greens and the reds to get some very nice and subtle and harmonious flesh tones. So a little bit more yellow ochre. And now what we're gonna do is um, with the designated shadow brush, I'm gonna recharge that brush. And it's gonna be important to have an understanding of your basic values, the basic tonality in the picture. So again, it's a dark green basically. And um, so what we want is a nice and clean transition between this point and this point, this area right here, this very much could be the value that we want for the dark light. So um, tell you what, let's go ahead and try that out first and we'll return to the uh, color value web. And this is going to introduce basically our very first plane change. So right here, hopefully this value will work. I mean, the color may be off a little bit, um, but it's okay. I think, you know, it's a little too hot. So I'm going to go ahead and off camera here, just a little bit of cobalt teal uh, to help to bring that down. See how that's kind of mixing very nicely. So now, you know, it can be kind of risky to put in this uh, value because, you know, I don't want to give her a five o'clock shadow, but it's important to look for the plane changes. And if you're new to painting, uh, this concept between uh, you know planes and the angles with respect to planes is going to be very important. I talk about planes all the time. Plane, plane, plane this, plane that. It's plain to see this, plain to see that. But really, this is important. See this angle here, 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 and then into the hair. And um, Let's get into a little bit more of the anatomical structures along with the color that we're mixing in here. So what you're seeing now is actually one of my glass palettes. Um, so basically it's just kind of cardboard and then taped onto the side just, uh, you know, so when I carry it around I don't cut my hands. So um, yeah, it's just glass and then some cardboard behind and I have a dry erase marker. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to guide you through the anatomical structures because I do talk about plane all the time, but I never really get into too much of the anatomical structure just because, you know, time constraints and stuff, but we are unlimited now. We're unlimited in time. You're going to be receiving these uploads every single day. You're going to have all of the process, if not maybe 99, 95% of the entire process captured on footage on film so you can see the process. So let's get into this. And so I'm going to be using, again, the glass. Uh, just because you know saving trees and stuff so what we're going to look at is the structure of the mandible so right now our model is turned in three quarter relative to us um, but closer to profile so imagine this is an egg or this is a ball of some sort and um got to make sure to check my autofocus but anyway so this is the center line of the model's face so again, we're conceptualizing the model's face as a ball right now or an egg of some sort. And this is the center line, like a medial line. This is the center line. So now let's get into what we were going to talk about. So the mandible, the jawbone. So it's going to come down uh, and create a little bit of an angle like that. And so basically the mandible, you can think about the head. If, if you look at the side of the head, uh, you know, the head is a ball with a jaw. Uh, so you know, um, a ball with the jaw, a little bit of a triangular shape there. This point to this point is actually the same as this point to this point. Uh, so basically, you know, if this was a perfect profile, this to this would be the same. Now, how does that, uh, you know, how does that relate to the, the jaw and the planes for the jaw? Um, it doesn't, but it does relate to proportion because we are seeing a point on the head all the way up here. And because she's closer to profile, we're actually seeing uh, a little bit more, should I say, uh, you know, from here to here than we would, or sorry, from here to here. We're seeing a little bit more from the backside of the head to this portion here. So uh, if we're looking at just the, uh, you know, the structure, this is actually very, very 
wide. So this is wider than if she was facing us forward. And you want to look at everything in terms of relation. So again, here is the plane uh, for the mandible. And again, I'm going to be drawing these shapes out in a very generic kind of fashion just because we want to look at this shape in particular. And this right here is an angle. And this is going to indicate a plane change. Again, this is a plane. Remember, a plane is just a three-dimensional construct of a flat sheet in three-dimensional space. These are all little planes. This way, this way, that way. So like this, we'll draw little vectors. This way, this way, this way. Now each plane has a direction with respect to the light source. So let's take this and move it down. So what we have is a simple triangle with a little bit of a wedge right there for the mandible. This point right here is going to give us the ramus of the jaw. As the ramus of the jaw starts to turn, um, then we're going to get a, a very, very subtle little shape change right there. But the plane is going this way, and then it starts to go down, 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 even further down, and then eventually it will reach shadow. So that's why we want that value scale on the palette so that we can draw out, uh, so we can paint those structures. So I hope that those little, um, you know, those little drawings, those uh, technical structural drawings are going to help. I'm going to try to incorporate more of those structural drawings with the dry erase marker just to explain a little bit more of, uh, you know, conceptually what's going on with those plane changes. Uh, so now that was much more of a conceptual thing, but now let's start to go and actually mix the gradations of tone. Uh, so again, just returning with this brush here, see if, let's see if I can get you a nice close-up shot of the palette here. Uh, just so you can see the mixing. So um, now we're going to create much more of a gradation of tone. And again, we kind of moved towards this direction uh, with the larger, you know, color palette. We started off very simple, uh, you know, with the four color palette, the Zorn color palette. Uh, so the Zorn palette again is the cadmium red, the ivory black, yellow ochre, and then your lead white, your flake white, essentially. And then this is all expanded from that uh, simple color palette. So again, now this is pretty much perfect middle tone. It's actually kind of the value of the palette anyway. So um, now with this middle tone brush, I'm going to start to uh, add more and more uh, flake white. And in the middle tone region, we want to have quite a lot of flake white. Flake white has this property of which it allows you to use more of it without raising the value too much. See how much paint, well you probably can't see exactly how much paint, but I am putting quite a lot more paint. It is a little bit more thin, so I'm actually going to start to slap on a bunch more paint. Uh, so just you can follow along with the paint mixtures. A lot of this is intuition, to be honest. Just practice mixing flesh tones on your palette. You know, you don't even have to look at a model per se, um, though I would uh, definitely suggest to look at a model for this. But what I'm doing is I'm blurring my eyes and I see that this is kind of greenish, though it doesn't look green. You'll see as we uh, transition to a lighter brush, so this is going to be the brush for the lighter values. It's going to be much more greenish than the, um, you know, the other tones. So now I'm going to start to move up the value range. And as I move up the value range, the colors are actually going to kind of get more pinkish. So this is actually now as we approach the cheekbone structure, and perylene red is going to be a nice red for that. And so as we approach the cheekbone area uh, in terms of the color family, Definitely going to be more pink right there. Mandible uh, is going to be much more greenish. And then as we move up, we're going to add the titanium white. So now we're kind of slowly graduating towards the titanium white. So the cadmium yellow deep, the uh, titanium white, yellow ochre, sap green, cadmium green. Um, so cadmium green, then the more titanium white cadmium yellow. Now you're seeing a very nice progression between these color value families. And this is probably going to be one of the lighter lights. So we won't need it that much. So now what we're going to have on the palette is a light, light brush and a, um, a middle tone brush, a little bit of the cobalt teal into here. You may be wondering what I'm going to use the dioxazine purple for. And at the dioxazine purple, I'm going to use it very similarly to the alizarin 
permanent in the darks that is. So I'm gonna use it to sneak in some extra color in the shadows, but not just yet. We'll get to that point. So again, this is the half tone brush and let's start to develop these planes. All right, so now we're gonna start to add in these very subtle plane changes. So I'm gonna have three brushes in hand right now. So I'm going to have the uh, shadow brush. I'm going to have the, um, the light light brush and the half tone brush. And we're gonna start to build the volumes from here. So this edge right here that we're working on is the edge for the dark light. An important thing to think about when you're, you know, when you're creating these paintings that you, you intend to layer or to make, uh, you know, realistic. Um, an important thing is really to have an idea of what your future self is going to need. So for me, I'm thinking my future self is going to want some very soft edges to work over top of. And I think it's even a little too bright on the camera. So I'm actually going to, yeah, I just brought down the, uh, you know, the, um, the ISO or the light sensitivity on the camera, just so that you can uh, see more of these tones. See how we're starting to gradate? See how you're getting the concept of the plane going this way, this way, that way, just like the arrows that we drew out before. And that might be a little bit too uh, green, or sorry, too orangey. So now we're throwing in the, uh, we're gonna throw in some of the cadmium green into here. And we wanna create a type of uh, under layer that we can continue to build over top of. But we're also going to try to um, try to observe each shape in relations. And if, if it's so, if it happens that we finish a certain area, then let it, we'll let it be, we'll let it, you know, be finished. So that being said, we're just very subtle now. So we're walking up towards these structures. And before I hit the uh, zygomatic bone, the cheekbone area here, um, I'm probably going to put in another little uh, structure demonstration just to clarify what's going to happen here in terms of the values. So we're just working our way up. Sorry, it's bumped into the camera. So we're working our way up. Uh, and so again, these planes right here are starting to turn away from the light just like we described in that, um, you know, that structural drawing, it's just turning away. So again, I'm gonna continue to add more cadmium green into this mixture. Again, just like the mixtures that you saw before in the middle tone region of the palette, but with a little more cadmium green now. And I know I'm probably giving her a five o'clock shadow, but it's important to uh, establish your gradations of tone, establish your structures. And uh, we're just gonna put in a little more of a soft edge here. And then I think, you know, what we'll talk about is this entire structure here. So in terms of the planes, let's go ahead and now talk about the structure. And so now we have the, um, the little, um, what are we gonna call this? The, um, let's call this the structure board. Now we have the structure board again. So uh, it's easy to clean off dry erase, you know, with just a paper towel, but anyway. So let's go ahead and let's make a big head. So that's gonna be where the head is going to be. And then here is the center line. And it doesn't have to be uh, pretty or anything. This is a uh, pr pretty much a structural diagram that we're going to look at. So again, we're going to look at the uh, axes so this is gonna be the axes for the eyebrow, axes for the eyes. And again, um, from here to here is going to be, halfway is gonna be probably around here in between the center of the, um, the uh, whatchamacallit, the axis for the eyes. We're gonna have an axis for the nose. And it's okay if I don't get the proportion of the model, that's not the point here. The point is to get the uh, un an understanding of these basic structures. Ear is gonna be somewhere over here. And again, this is gonna be how you construct a basic human head. So this is how we get towards that, the human look, even though this is gonna be very much kind of like a cartoon. So now we're gonna have the corner of the eye socket on one side, corner of the eye socket on the other side. And now we're gonna have a little shape for the forehead. And then now we're gonna get into the thing that we were initially supposed to talk about, which we're gonna talk about now, which is the zygomatic plane, the orbiculars and the, um, so the orbiculars oris and the, um, the side plane for the nose. So let's get into an in-depth analysis of these planes. And so again, we're going to look at planes. So the 
cheekbone, zygomatic bone, we can look at it just like this. So that's going to be a one large plane. This is going to be the uh, glabella right here. That's the glabella. And then that um, is going to be a little bit, okay, so that's going to be a shape right here for the concavity of the eye socket. And again, this plane is going to go all the way down here. And now we're going to get a little bit of the structure of the nose. So right around here, this is the maxilla region of the face. This is the cheekbone region. So now we're going to look at the nose. So here we're going to have a nasal bone right there a little bit. Nasal bone is actually going to be a little bit higher up uh, than the uh, the axes of the eyes. So the axes of the eyes are going to go somewhere over here. And then here we're going to have a plane, a very simple plane change for the nose. And that very simple planar analysis is going to be what's going to help guide those brush strokes. It's going to help add a little bit more information into the colors and the values that we're going to add. And then as the plane starts to taper in this direction, there's going to be kind of a bridgeway between the side plane of the nose, the, uh, the cheekbone, so the side plane of the nose into the maxilla, and then here we have the cheekbone area. And then now it's going to get interesting as we work down here. This is going to be the area uh, that I'm going to definitely want to clarify a little bit because there's a lot of subtlety and let's be honest, the photograph flattens it out a little bit and that's usually the case. It's not the problem with the uh, uh, photography. It's just, you know, that's just how it is. It flattens this area out. So if that's going to be our major plane for the cheekbone right here, the mandible is going to go down here, ramus of the jaw there. Here, it's going to get interesting because the planes, this is much more facing the light, this plane here, it's going to taper down towards here, right? And then it's going to get a little bit darker. See those angles? These are vectors. These vectors are basically giving us the directionality of the plane. So it's going to be turning darker, but guess what? Now it's going to actually straighten out and it's just going to kind of be facing straight down. So we're just looking at the vectors of each one of these planes. Remember a vector uh, isn't, it's just a point, right? It has a specific angle. It has a specific magnitude. So again, not to get terribly complicated, just this way, this way, down, and then over. So this is going to be a very, very intricate thing we're going to get into with much more, you know, it's going to look much prettier, hopefully, in the painting, or maybe not. But it's going to turn down as you're seeing it. Let's exaggerate it even more. It's going to turn down and then over and then it's going to go straight. Now that's going to handle, that's going to help us handle that section here. And there's going to be another plane change right here. So hopefully I'm keeping this simple enough. So large plane, large plane, large plane there. And then this is where the complexity happens right here. This is going to be one of the more complicated areas of the face. So that's why I had to break it down in terms of the vectors. And so now we're going to look at the orbicularis oris. So, you know, lips like, here are lips, right? You would imagine like front of the lip, bottom of the lip, and you would think, okay, I can draw lips and then that's it. No, I'm not gonna ever tell you what to do. I'm not gonna tell you, you must do this, you must do that, but with lips, lips are much easier to, to move around, to manipulate, but what's important is right here, this is gonna be the structure. This is gonna be a planar analysis of the orbicularis oris, this is gonna be a shape turning down and over. This is usually referred to, and here the chin would come out here. So again, we're looking at the entire planar analysis of the face because this is there's gonna be a lot of subtle things going in here. So the mouth is usually referred to as a, a cylinder. The structure for the mouth is usually the teeth cylinder. So let's go ahead and put that here. And then once we introduce the teeth cylinder, I'm going to go right back into the mixing the oil paints. So again, cylinder, right? The cylinder has this axis right here. And so the mouth, one point, the other point, middle point. So the mouth, here's the mouth. So the mouth will actually taper away and you'll see it because it'll get darker over here and then it'll go facing the light more over here, giving us a highlight over here. And then it's going to turn ever so slightly this way, but the direction of that curve is very cylindrical. It's a very cylindrical structure. And then we have the outside of the face 
and then we have the chin down here. And that's going to be very, very important to understand when we get into the large uh, mixing of color. All right, so here we are back with the painting. Let's see if I can just adjust the angle a little bit. All right, so uh, now let's get into this portion here because that is definitely going to be an area of uh, very, very much a complex area in terms of its value. See right there, that's pushing it. That's putting in a plane change using the wrong brush. <laughs> but in any case, it's gonna get darker here and it's gonna get a little bit uh, more of a kind of lavender kind of tone now I'm pushing it a little too orangey but you get my point uh, with the value so the um, the value is going to get much lighter towards here as you're seeing in the photo reference it's going to get much lighter there and then it's going to taper towards this section here so it's going to taper downwards like that so again I'm throwing in way too much orange so let's get you onto the palette here and we're going to want to tint see how this is too orangey we're going to want to tint it um, basically cooler we're actually going to use a lizarin crimson permanent sap green remember those two colors were meant for each other cobalt teal very important with the cobalt teal to help bring down the heat and it helps bring down the heat much faster. So even though I have a lot more colors, um, I'm actually kind of saving some of the more expensive colors, you know, like uh, the cadmium red. I mean, this is all expensive, but, um, you know, using the cobalt teal and just a tiny bit of it will do a lot of the work that more, say, yellow ochre would have taken. And now, again, with the uh, flake white, titanium white, and so that's just basically showing you how to shift the color value web a certain direction. It was too orangey, and so I shifted it a little bit more kind of a pinkish, greenish. So now you have that. Let's get back into actually applying the uh, planes onto the face. So hopefully these adjustments will help certainly helping to cut back on that um, that orangey tone definitely so again I'm getting very very subtle now with these transitions of plane and it's important to understand the directionality of each one of those planes that's why I'm going to start to introduce those uh, little diagrams and please let me know in the comments if those diagrams uh, you know, if the diagrams are helping you out so far, um, you know, helping to clarify some of the more conceptual things that I wouldn't necessarily want to draw onto the, uh, you know, the finished painting. So that was a little bit too much perylene red, so I'm going to contrast it with the cadmium green. Perylene and cadmium green look like they might have a thing going. So, you know, just like sap green and alizarin go really well together, I think perylene and um, apparently in red and sap green. Hmm, something interesting there. So anyway, so now see it? See that subtlety? Now, of course, I'm going to make it even more subtle. And remember, subtlety just means how close can you get the values to one another yet maintain their differentiation. And remember, they are differentiated because of their relative angle. So the angle with respect to the light. And that angle is basically determined by those uh, vectors that it was drawing in that, um, in that conceptual drawing. So we're very much going to consider the directionality of the planes with much more specificity now. And uh, I'll tell you what, even though um, we're putting in a lot of information into the painting. You're not seeing a lot result from it. So there is a quite a lot of information that goes into uh, a painting, especially a realist painting. And remember I was saying before, um, you know, like there's a delicate balance between, um, there's a delicate balance between copying something and visually interpreting it and creative, creating a, um, a work of art. And so that understanding of those concepts in those, um, those drawings hopefully will help to guide you towards 
uh, more specificity in your painting. So throwing in a little bit more of the burnt umber and the uh, cadmium green into that area. I actually used a dark brush by accident, so a lizard and ivory black. Those two colors actually like each other as well, so a lizard and ivory black. Uh, maybe not, shouldn't say that because, you know, a lizard and sap green. But anyway, um, now with the orbicularis auris, with the half tone brush, do you remember that little W looking shape that I drew on the bottom here? And do you remember how I said that the mouth was kind of like a cylinder? The structure of the mouth, some people refer to it as the muzzle of the mouth or whatever. Um, this is going to be basically it. So you can see it very clearly actually on the photo reference, this darker value. And the reason that it's darker is just because this plane is turning away from the light. So the vector, um, the direction of that vector is going to be uh, basically downwards. And so the flesh tones are now starting to get much more subtlety. And uh, tell you what, so I'll let you in on a little secret here just between you and me, okay? So um, when you're painting flesh tone, when you're painting, uh, you know, you want to get the local flesh tone of the model or you want to, you know, make it look like a flesh tone. Something that I'm going to try to do is add more variety to the color, the hue color variations. And perhaps I might even push them further than I see them in nature, just, you know, for fun. So right around here, I'm actually pushing more of the orangey pinkish. Here we have the, uh, you know, the greener tones. And uh, the reason that I'm doing that is just because I find that my colors, when I look at a lot of my portrait paintings, especially the ones that are featured on YouTube, a lot of them, um, their colors are pretty predictable. And I don't want to make colors that are, you know, uh, prescriptions. Like I don't want to have just a recipe for certain colors. I want to actually, add more variety to them. So now as we move up on these planes, I think I may um, put in a little more of a top plane here. And we're gonna treat this like a wig maker's block. So we're gonna be looking at all of these structures. And once I cover all these structures with a basic tone, I'm then gonna transition into uh, refining the uh, color shapes. And at that point, I think it'll be uh, time to transition into tomorrow's video. So let's just go ahead and fill in all of these planes and kind of create a wig maker's block. So you're not really looking at the palette right now because the important thing is the value, even though I do have a lot more colors than I did explain earlier, um, you know, how to mix the flesh tones. It's not that important now, I think, to show you every single uh, mixture of color rather you get the general idea basically you get the big picture of how those colors are mixed up so with a little more perlene red and cobalt teal perlene red cobalt teal will give us a nice little lavender uh, color and we want that for the bottom of the nose so again right over here and here and just to ensure it's not too red a little bit more cobalt teal And remember the side plane of the nose, this is the bottom, like basically the under plane of the nose. You know, that value is almost all right for the uh, side plane of the nose. So with the half tone brush, I'm not really gonna mess with that color too much. I don't know, just something like that. Ought to do. Then a little bit, um, a little bit lighter. So a little more of the reds into this area here. You want to watch out with green. Don't want to put too much green in this area. The greens, they live somewhere around here, but the reds and the pinks live over here. If we put too much green into there, it's going to look like someone punched her in the face. And um, it's not the look that we're going after. Okay, so that plane there is going to be lighter. And um, 
you know, I think that it's going to be a little bit more yellow. So the cadmium yellow medium, remember that lighter yellow? So the cadmium yellow medium and uh, yeah, just a little bit like that. I feel like I'm singing that song just a little bit. But yeah, basically it's just a little bit of that. And now, woof, that's way too red. So the titanium white into the middle tone region of the palette. There we go. So now we're starting to get more, still a little bit too red. So let's use the uh, sap green. And it's important to work up, I think, to a, uh, should I say, yeah, work up towards more color on your palettes. But if you're just starting out, I would definitely suggest the Zorn palette. That is the limited palette. So that's the cadmium red, the yellow ochre, and then black and white. But when you, you know, when you've been working with those flesh tones for a while, then I think it's a, it's a good time to start to throw in uh, much more color. And if you want to see videos on the, uh, you know, using the Zorn palette, the Zorn limited palette, I definitely have a few of them on my uh, YouTube channel. So we're just gonna throw in a little bit more pink into that region and I think we'll call it a day for now. Oh wait, how could I forget the neck? Yeah, I need to put some color on the neck. All right, so now we have covered all of those major planes so now that we've covered all of those major planes, I think that's gonna be it with the painting, but we do have another uh, post-it note that I can uh, talk about. So let's go ahead and get this post-it note. So hopefully, I don't know if I can say your name right, but uh, Giorgio April, oh gosh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how to say, April, April, um, sorry. Uh, so your comment, you were talking about landscapes and why don't I paint landscapes? I do, I do actually like to paint landscapes. Let's see if I, I can uh, put in some of my landscapes here. And so now what you're seeing here is one of the landscapes that I painted. Uh, <laughs> it's not much of a landscape, but it is a building. It's a, it's a shed. It's a shed. Um, some grass, another shed in the background. Yeah, this is a landscape that was painted on location, pretty much all wet on wet, a la prima probably. I did this one really fast, I think maybe two, three, I want to say three hours or two hours outside on location. Um, so yes, I do do some landscape. Um, the only reason I haven't done landscape is just because I like to paint on a location, uh, meaning plein air painting from life. But um, here's an example of a painting that I created using a picture. And this one, um, I, yes, this one was painted from a picture. It's also mostly palette knife actually with a little bit of brushing into here. Uh, so I actually did this one also a very, very long time ago. Uh, but I also did this one a la prima. So wet on wet, maybe again, maybe two or three hours, three or four, maybe uh, not much more than that. Um, and again, uh, something, Something interesting about this one. Um, so uh, one of my birthdays a while ago, someone gave me like, you know, those uh, those oil paint sets. Um, but it was uh, like Artist Loft brand or something. So it wasn't something I could use for portrait. Uh, but this is actually student grade color <laughs> that I used to create this, this landscape. Um, and yes, I do love painting landscape. I actually like painting a little bit larger as you're seeing here. Um, but if if you would like to see some landscape painting videos, I'm not opposed to it. It's just that I'm going to have to work from uh, photo reference. So that's the only thing. I'm gonna have to work from photo reference because taking all of my equipment outdoors, I definitely would need a film crew for that, which I don't have a film crew for that yet. But anyway, this is another example of one of my landscape paintings. And I will say sometime in the very, very near future, if you look back here, you now see a collection of paintings starting to emerge. So uh, one of the things that um, I'm gonna be working on uh, with the help of my girlfriend, Lucy, is to um, create a collector's gallery. So those of you that have been watching my videos for a very, very long time and are interested in having your own painting of mine, your own painting either created on or off, 
the YouTube set. I'm going to have collector's gallery along with other features on this site called Patreon. So Patreon, for those of you that may not know, it's a uh, it's basically a, a site where you can help fund artists. So artists that are uh, you know producing contents like content like me, uh, you can help fund us. You can basically help us. So I definitely would love to be able to paint from life. I would love to have my own studio in a larger area, you know, with some ventilation and things like that. So, you know, the basic things I would love to have, and you can definitely become a part of that. And all of that is going to happen very, very soon. That being said, I'm now going to transition into tomorrow's video. So I really hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. I really hope that these painting videos are helping you out. I wish you the best in all of your artwork. And as always, I'll be back again very soon.